play. Broke <coughs> down the wrong chapter for some reason. Well, let's start with chapter 20 and verse number 2. <clears throat> verse number 1, now Abraham uh, journeyed from there to the land of Negev and, and uh, settled between Kadesh and Shur. And then uh, he uh, pilgrimed in Gerar for a while. These are Philistinian people, Philistines. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. <coughs> So Abimelech, king of Gerar. By the way, the word Abimelech, what does that mean? That means uh, father of the king. Abimelech means father of the king. Names mean a whole lot. Okay, Names mean a whole lot. And among the culture of the Bible and even uh, all down through the ages, names have meant a lot. Okay? Uh, you go back and you see the name Hawkins. It probably meant something at one time. Yeah, a bunch of horse thieves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, my grandfather uh, arrested a hawking back there, and they sent him to prison for killing that horse thief. Yeah. A hawking was a horse thief. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was sentenced to 10 years in Detroit prison for, for killing old hawking. Well, hawking means something. You know, it meant something back then. Uh, names mean something in the Bible. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. What does that Melchizedek mean? The king of righteousness. Huh? The priest. The priest of God. The priest of God. The king of righteousness. Melak, king of righteousness. Is that good? All right. The king of righteousness. All right. That's what his name meant. Meant. So we see uh, Abimelech here. And God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night. Now, <clears throat> what usually happens in these dreams? Hmm? What happens in dreams? Remember I told you, what, what is the Greek word for dream? Hypnose. Hypnosis. So God hypnotized Abimelech. All right, he hypnotizes Abimelech, and he speaks to his heart. He speaks to his soul. All right? Abimelech, father of the king, in a dream of the night, and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. Behold, you are a dead man. Because the woman whom you have taken, she is married. Now, what, what did, what's going on here? Abraham goes out there and uh, he, and he tells his wife, "Don't dress like a married woman now. Dress like an available virgin. Available virgin. That's the first used car lot in the Bible. Uh, dress like an available virgin, a woman that's unattached. How did a woman that's unattached dress? Sleazy? Huh? Sleazy? No." Well, she was she she was pretty much covered. Yes, women were very covered. But uh, were they back then, like like the nuns are today. No, not the nuns don't have anything to do with it. But uh, what did they basically do? They could uncover their face. Uh, all right. Once a woman was married, she could never uncover her face. Her face was for her husband only. That sounds like Muslim. It was. That's where the Muslims got the idea. All right, the Muslims got the idea from this culture. This is the culture. All right. Now let's go uh, to Genesis, the 29th chapter. We're going to jump over there just a little bit now. Because we're going to find out this dress code of a virgin, okay? <clears throat> Genesis, the 29th chapter. Starting with about verse number uh, 13. Now here, what? No, I just say, I hang out with these Muslim girls and they, at school, they do homework sometimes and they call them scarves. Yeah, they wear their scarves. They okay. have to wear their scarves when they come of age. They cover their hair. Okay? Uh, <coughs> the, the Muslim culture came from the Bible, by the way. 
The way they lived came from the Word of God. It came from the time that the Word of God was given. Okay? That's why they act like that today. And, of course, our culture, our Western culture, has been introduced to the Middle East, and they think we're a bunch of devils over here. Because we act like devils. <laughs> we dress like devils, okay? Let's go on back now. Verse number 13 in the 29th chapter of Genesis. So it came about when Laban heard the news of Jacob. Now Jacob's over there. He's, he's uh, uh, in, in the territory where Abraham came from. Here we have Laban, Laban, okay? His name is actually Laban. That's a salt bait, okay, Laban. And it came about when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his son, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him into his house and then related to Laban all of these things. He told him all the stories. And Laban said, Surely you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. And Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, you should there, why should you therefore uh, work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages is. Now Laban had two daughters. Now pay attention to the dress code of a virgin. All right, now let's see just a little bit in this time. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. So we have Leah and we have Rachel. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> now, these two girls. And Leah's eyes were weak. Now, Joanne, you've got a little bit better translation than that, I think. It says, uh, well, I was reading... We get the first one. Leah had pretty eyes. That's right. And on the bottom it says, or dull eyes, the meaning of Hebrew is uncertain. All right. The Hebrew, the meaning of the Hebrew is not quite so uncertain as they make it. It says that she had a dull eyes or weak eyes. What the idea in the Hebrew is that when she looked upon a man with her eyes, the man became weak. He became weak, helpless. She had a... Uh, uh, a captivating, adorable eyes. Okay? She just absolutely would sweep a man off her feet with a glance. That's the term. He would, she would make a man weak by her glance. Okay? Make men weak by her glance. <laughs> and, uh, but Rachel was beautiful in uh, face and form. All the way. Now their faces were uncovered. Their faces were uncovered because they're virgins. So they're out walking around. They are dressed modestly, but their faces are uncovered. Now let's go back to the 20th chapter. The 20th chapter. have her uncover her face so they could see her beauty. That's right. Okay. She wasn't married. Yeah. She's she's not she's got she's acting like a virgin. Yeah. She's acting like a virgin. All right. <coughs> Let's see back. Then we're gonna go back into Genesis the twelfth chapter. Still on chapter 20? We're on chapter 20 right now. Now, but <coughs> Abimelech in a dream in the night. Now, God has hypnotized Abimelech. Behold, you're a dead man because this woman whom you have taken, she is married. Now, even back in that culture, they had some type of morality. Okay? Now, he couldn't take uh, another man's wife. She's married. And Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation that is righteous? That's what it says there, a nation that is righteous. We're just, we're righteous, we're, 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 we're not a bunch of criminals here. I have done this uh, uh, a sin of ignorance. I didn't know this woman. She's dressing like a virgin. I'm innocent, Lord. She's dressing like a virgin. Back in this period of time, a woman that was married, everybody would have known. Right now, how do you tell if a woman's married? Come ring. on, Keezy. Ring. A ring. A ring. They got a ring on her ring. 
Back like then, they they dressed differently. All right. Uh, and did not him say to me, she's my sister. And she herself, she said, this is my brother. In justice, in integrity of my heart, I am innocent. My hands have not done this. And then the Lord said to him in a hypnotic trance, again, still in this dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and also kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. I look at this. You know, we just got through going to this deal with with uh, Harold Camping, the end of the world, uh, what do you call the end of the world, and the rapture, which yesterday at 6 p.m. For us. Now, now listen. Harold Camping uh, spent four years studying the Bible by himself. He was going to teach himself the Bible. Instead of going to a real good conservative Bible school with all of his millions of dollars that he has spent uh, carrying out his gospel to the world, do you see how important he bypassed one of God's churches? He bypassed one of the rules. Where do we teach? Where is the Word of God taught? From churches. He was going to find out for himself what the Bible says. We're in the church age, people. He is so theologically messed up more than anybody that I have ever known in my life. He's just like a cult. <clears throat> like so many of my old teachers said, he's, he's full of sheep dip right up to the top. 99.9% full. Just because what he says now, now it's going to be real hard to witness to people, isn't it? Here, this so-called Bible scholar and everything else, for years saying the Lord's coming to the end. Now look at this guy here. Look at Abraham now. Now if if the Bible wasn't true, for one thing, I wouldn't have put this story in the Bible if I was trying to make up anything. Because here is here is the man of God, the man of faith, doing this, using his wife as a floozy to come in here and get money from these people. That's a little dishonest, this isn't it? Somebody might say, well, that's Jewish behavior. <laughs> Walk into a Jewish clothing store and, and put on this coat three times too big and he grabs the back up and says, oh, it fits you just fine. <laughs> Perfect fit. <laughs> I know that in integrity of your heart and I've kept you from sinning. Now, therefore, restore this man's life for he is a prophet. He will pray for you. What a joke. But it's true, what? He wasn't quite living up to par so far. And you will live. But if you do not restore her, know this, that you shall surely die, and you and all your sons. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all the things in their hearing, and they were greatly frightened. They were just out of their senses. What in the world are we going to do? Here we got a prophet of God among us, and he's running around uncovering his wife. She's dressing like a virgin, and she's married. And Abimelech called for Abraham and said to him, What have you done? Why have you done this to us? And how have I sinned against you and that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? And you have done to me these things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely there is no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife because she is actually my sister and the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother and she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house. See, he's blaming everything on God, isn't he? Blame shifting. I said to her, this is the kindness which you will show to me everywhere you go. He is my brother. Abimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and stored his, his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech had said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle where you please. And, and to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother thousands of pieces of silver. Behold, go buy yourself some clothes and cover up. That's exactly what it says in Hebrew. He said, Go cover yourselves up so you will be 
safe among other men. Go dress like a, like a married woman. Go buy yourself a lady. And Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abraham, Abimelech, and his wife, and his maids, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed the opening of their wombs. They could not even procreate, period. That ought to have been an indicator to them that something was going on, period. All right, now let's go back to the 12th chapter and see what happens here. And it says, uh, Abraham again, now this is before this last story. I mean, he had pulled this trick again before. So he was getting real good at it. Used car salesman, Brother Bill. <laughs> and it came about in verse number 11 or 10, actually, there's famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt. It's rain. All right, that's what it, how you say uh, in uh, Egypt in, uh, in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, down to the land of Mitzrayim, to sojourn there. By the way, the word Mitzrayim means red mud, it means banks, it means bulwarks, it means big cities, it means uh, bulwarks. There's canals there, and it's a ground of red dirt, is what it says, red clay ground. For well, the famine was severe in the land, and it came about that when he came near to Egypt, that, sa that uh, he said to Sarai, his wife, now her name is Sarai, which means what? Hostile. Hostile. Wild woman. <laughs> what are you reading there? Huh? What are you reading? That's number 11. Uh, Genesis 12 and number 11. Oh, okay. All right. And see now that I know that you are a beautiful woman. All right. And it will come about when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is my wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. He kind of a chicken, wasn't he? He was a, a rascal. Yeah, chicken lived. He was using her. He was using his wife <laughs> to get money. I, mean, I don't blame him for that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yet he's known like like the man of faith. That's right, the man of faith. So do you see what God can use? If God can use Abraham, he can use Brett. <laughs> That's right. If God can use Abraham, he can use me. All right. If God can use David, he can use us. Let's go on a little Further. And it came about when Abraham came to the Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. How did they see it? How did they see she was beautiful? She had, had a veil on her face. Had a veil on her face. That's right. She was advertising. Advertising her wares. <laughs> you, you know what? That, that, them days they opened with their face and shit. Now they wear a bikini yeah. to advertise. And it came about, and Abraham went into Egypt, the Egyptians, and saw the woman was very beautiful. Now, Pharaoh's officials saw, the, saw her. He, they saw her. And praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And therefore he treated Abraham well for her sake. And gave him what? Sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants. He's got servants now. Slaves. Female donkeys and camels. And the Lord struck Pharaoh in his house with a great plague because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called to Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you let her dress like a virgin? Why? He was scared. Huh? He was scared that yeah. him. And he would get money. The love of riches. All right. Because of her beautiness for the same reason. Yeah. Why did you say that she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. And now then, here is your wife. Take her and get out of my land. And not only said take her and get out of my land, he, he sent guides with him to make sure he left the place. He wanted him out. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him by force. 
with his wife and everything that belonged to him out. He was 86. Out. All right. Now let's just, let's go to Genesis the uh, 26 chapter, I think. Genesis 26. I want you to know that Isaac was another one of these guys that didn't make his wife dress right. Really? That's right. How come you think he did that? Huh? How come you did that? Well, let's go and look. Okay. Let's go take another look. That's the scripture. The dress code of a virgin. Like father, like son. Like father, like son. Now, let's look at this woman. This is, uh, who is this woman? Rebecca. Who? Rebecca. 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 All right. And he, uh, Eliezer goes over and he gets Rebecca from Laban in that area again. He, He brings her home. And he marries her, uh, Isaac marries her, and Isaac's name is Laughter. You know, they laughed at God when, when he was to be born, so they said, well, you name him Laughter, okay? Name him Laughter. And uh, guess what happens here now? They go to, uh, in the 26th chapter, 26th chapter, look what happens here. In verse number 1, now there was a famine in the land. Does that sound like a story that we heard before? <laughs> Famine in the land. And besides the previous famine that, uh, that had occurred in the days of Abraham, so Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. Here we go again, back down to the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land. God warned him. Stay in the land which I shall tell you, and and pilgrim in this land, and it will be, and I will be to you, and bless you. And for to you and to your descendants I will give all of these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. By the way, Israel has never really possessed all of that land, have they? Now those Jews over there in the land, the, the current prime minister is a real radical. Okay? And he said, we want all the land back to the ancient boundaries. <laughs> guess what? They sure didn't accept the ancient Messiah, did they? They'll never have that land until they accept the Messiah. I don't care what they, how many A-bombs they shoot on all the nations around them. It's not going to happen. God will give that land to <coughs> himself when they accept. When they say what? Blessed and holy is he that came in the name of the Lord. Things are going to get real bad first. And I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, how is that going to happen? To the Messiah. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, and Isaac lived in Gerar. Now, God has just appeared to Isaac. He has just told all these things to him, and what does Isaac do? He undresses his wife. That's what he does. And when the men of the place asked about his wife, he said what? She is my sister. She wasn't his sister at all, was she? Period. Abraham only half lied. Isaac thoroughly lies, because she is not his sister. <clears throat> for he was afraid to save my wife, thinking that the men of the place might kill him on account of Rebecca, for she is beautiful. And it came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was uh, procreating with his wife. That's what it literally said. Our sister, (laughs) they are making love. That's what's going on here. And Abimelech called to Isaac and said, 
Behold, certainly she is your wife. Well, she is. They were having. They were right in the act of marriage. All right, they saw. Them. Wasn't any beating around the bush about this. <coughs> How then do you say she's my sister? So Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said to her, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon all of us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be cut to get there. Oh. And God blessed him. In spite of it. Look what it says there in verse number 12. So Isaac sold in the land and reaped the same a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer and richer and they became extremely, exceedingly more <coughs> wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and great households, so that the Philistines envied him. She didn't dress like a virgin either, did she? And this was supposed to be a man of God. It ought to be something for us to make sure that our wives cover their faces up. <laughs> act like act like married women and not floozies. The dress code, like the, uh, the dress code of a virgin. Sounds like the Germans with the Jews jealous of what they had. Let's go back now to the Ezekiel 34. Let's go back and look into this a little more. We want on that little sidetrack. Is that little sidetrack fun? All right. A little learn a little something in it. All right. What, what chapter did you? 34. Ezekiel 34. <coughs> yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Isn't um, the word "fluzy" a bad word? Well, what were they acting like? They were acting like available women. And that was what? She was a flirt. Sarah was a flirt. Rebecca was a flirt. And then I think they both said that. You could use the word flirt or floozy, whichever one you want to get. But they were flirting with the men, weren't they? And they were. They were saying we're were available, and they were not. They were lying. Well, because the husband asked. Yeah, that husband asked them to lie. Take your veil off and act like a virgin. Act like an available young woman. So they were obeying. Yeah, they were obeying, all right. The head of the house. But she was having fun, wasn't they, both of them? They were getting attention. She did it or she wouldn't have done it. She wanted to do it or she wouldn't have done it. That's right. In the original language, it said that she did it. Real good. (laughs) Actively. (laughs) Enthusiastically, they did this. Smiled a lot to everybody that came along. See my face? I don't have a veil on. I'm available. All right. Now let's go on. We saw, looked at the 10th chapter of, uh, of John last week. We looked at Psalm 23. <coughs> and then in verse 20 it says, And the Lord God said that, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you uh, push with a side with your shoulder and thrust all the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. Therefore I will deliver my flock and they will no longer be a prey. He said, my... My sheep, I will protect them. Therefore I will deliver my flock and they will no longer be a prey. And I will judge between one sheep and another. And I will set over them one shepherd. Who is this shepherd that he's talking about here? Jesus. Jesus, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself, and he and, and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them, and I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, what he's talking about here, he's jumping all the way over here to the millennium. You know, the Bible, you, you have to be real careful how you interpret it. You won't be like the Herald Camping with all his wild ideas. You have to find out what is the context to interpret the Scripture. What he says here, he just got this through finishing and saying that uh, Israel had bad shepherds. They would shep- Israel's shepherds had been taken advantage of the sheep. They had been killing the sheep and eating the sheep 
and fleecing the sheep and not caring about the sheep when one of them went astray, they didn't go after it. Now let's go on. And he said, I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate the harmful beasts from the land. That's a millennium. And we're going to get over that for real soon. By the way, Ezekiel and uh, Isaiah say more about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ than the book of Revelation does. Do you know that? Tremendous amount about the millennial reign. And here's one, one of the things right here. And they will no longer be prey to the nations, and the beast earth will not devour them, but they will live securely, and no one will make them afraid. In verse number 31, As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. Now let's go to chapter 35. <clears throat> now God is going to judge Edom. Who's Edom, by the way? Esau. Esau. Mount Seir. That was where his people lived, Mount Seir. All right, Mount Seir is what? And today, what, where is this place? You, have you been there, haven't you? Petra. 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 All right, Petra. All right. Now, one time Petra was a trade center. Of the world, huh? Of the world at that time. Petra was a trade center. And they said, look at here. I mean, God had brought judgment. He said, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to just vacate your land. He said, I will make, verse number 7, I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation, and I will cut off from it at the one who passes through and returns. And they said, we're New York City. We're Philadelphia. We're London. We're Berlin. And you think that you're going to stop us? What happened? God, uh, back in those days, that was a center. That was a trade route where they went. What God did was make the trade route. He put it in the hearts of other people to use a different. They went up to Palmyra instead of through Edom. Through Seir. And they bypassed the place, and after a while, it became a total, absolute ghost town. It's no more. Nobody lived there anymore. There was no way to make a living. They, out there in that desert, you had to have people coming through there. They could lodge them. They could feed them. They could do all kinds of stuff. But when they had no visitors, it became a ghost town. And pretty soon, in history, they thought this place was absolutely a myth. Did you know that? They thought for years that Petra really didn't exist, that this Mount Seir was really a figment of somebody's imagination, that God had cursed this thing. And then finally they stumbled across it. And there this ancient civilization was, that God had cursed. It will no longer be a trade route. No one will pass through it and return. And I will fill its mountains with its slain, and your hills and your valleys, and all your ravines, those slain by the Lord, <coughs> that will fall. Now what Israel is going to be called to this place in the end time and yeah. they're going to be called well, by the way Israel's a very proud people aren't they? Mm -hmm. they? They they rebel they relish their pride that God chose Abraham. But I want you to know one thing Abraham had three wives The first woman they had a child with, a child with was a Hamite, not Sarah. And then he had a child, which was Isaac by Sarah. Sarah was a Shemite. So we have a Hamite, we, we have a Shemite now. And Keturah was what? A Japhethite. So guess what? All of us are related to Abraham. All three races of mankind are related to Abraham. Now, we have got as much right, more right, than the Jews do today, more right than the Jews do to say, say, God is our God. Why? Because we believe in Jesus. Because we believe in the Messiah that, that, that God sent. The shepherd, remember? The shepherd that would come. Uh, so, All right. yeah. so, Hagar was the what? From Hagar what? was a Hamite. Hamite. It was Egyptian. If you go and trace your DNA, you'll go back and you'll find out that you go back to Abraham. All of us really have... A, you know, they say if you go back 30 or 40 generations, everybody's related to everybody. He 
if you go back about a hundred generations, you're going to find that we're all closely related. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Keturah was a Japhethite. In other words, she's the white race. Keturah. The white. Keturah. We have a we have a Jew with a Shemite. We have a Hamite, which we have the darker races. So we got Abraham fathering all three races of people. So to Egyptian and Abraham make does that make a uh, Arab? Is that what it is? Well, a lot of them are Arabs. All the Arabs trace themselves back to Abraham, don't they? Yeah. Ishmael, was Ishmael really Abraham's son? Yeah. His name means God here. How about Esau? Was Esau really a son of Abraham? Sure he was. Now let's look at the, the, the sad story. The devil's always busy, isn't he? He was busy with Abraham. He was busy with Isaac. Doesn't he? We just saw some of this ungodliness in these people of, of faith. The devil's always busy. I always tell people I know where he is. He's right behind me. Following me all the time. Possibly. Well, God uses us in spite of us. All right? Now, he says here that uh, I'm going to lay Edom waste. But back in the New Testament period of time, who was on the throne of Israel when Jesus was born? Herod. Yeah. Herod, which was Esau's descendant, not Jacob's descendant. He wasn't supposed to be on there, right? All right. He wasn't supposed to be on the throne, but the devil got him on the throne, didn't he? Through the Roman Empire, sister and demon. Uh, Brother Phillips, and Abraham have uh, six children with Keturah. Yeah. So those are... Uh, they are not mentioned after the no. chapter 25 of no. but that's, Genesis. But they went among the Japhethite races. That's who they were. You go and you study in the book of Genesis. I hope to, if the Lord gives me strength. I went to the doctor the other day and he looked at me and he said, Boy, you're in bad shape. You need your left shoulder operated on. You need the neck, op neck operated on. You need your right shoulder operated on. you got a tumor in your chest. You may have a tumor in your pancreas. He said, oh, you need all these operations, but I ain't going to touch you until you go to this other doctor. You ask him to check you out. Then you ask, and I called that one. He said, I ain't touching you either. <laughs> you go to this other doctor. One after the other. Sam J. If I can make it and teach the rest of the book of Genesis, I'm going to teach up to chapter 25. I've already printed it. We're going to try to get it printed. And he teaches, boy, I tell you what, if you teach the first 41 verses, or 41 classes that I taught in the book of Genesis, give you a tremendous foundation of the races of mankind. You were here, Rex and Linda, with those classes. There's some, so much information in there that you can't even believe what's in that book. I spent a lot of time in Genesis, Brother Rex. I noticed, uh, I got a wondering, what was the Jaffa doing down in the Middle East? Well, that's where they all came from. I know, but they all went to Europe. They went back that way, but we ended up with one, and now here they go back again. They come back and forth all the time. Back and forth. We can see that. Therefore, I, as I live, declares the Lord, I will deal with you according to your, ang according to your anger, according to your envy, which you showed because of your hatred against them. So I will make myself known among them when I judge you. He's talking about Esau's descendants. Remember when when uh, Israel came out of Egypt, they tried to go through Seir, and they wouldn't let them go. That says they hated them, their anger. And because of that, God is going to judge them from now on. He doesn't forget. What you do definitely reflects upon your children. Do you know that? It does. It happened with Abraham and Isaac, didn't it? Now, number 36. Chapter number 36. Oh, this is my best chapter. Oh, that's good. This, this is the best one. one. This is All best. right. Let me see something. Here we are. <laughs> God talks to the mountains. God talks to the mountains. And the mountains here. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. To the mountains. To the land. 
The Bible says that the very animals in this world and the very land cries up to God for the redemption. Man sold the whole world, the whole earth, into sin, didn't he? In the garden. And they want to be back in harmony with God. The animals want to be in harmony with God. Nature wants to be in harmony with God. It doesn't want to be controlled by a bunch of greedy rascals fighting over land. I've told you so many times, at one time, all the way from the furthest part of British Isles, all the way to the Middle East, a, a squirrel could jump from one tree to the other and never hit the ground. Until they tore all the trees down and chopped them all down for vehicles of war. Thus said the Lord God, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession, therefore prophesying thus says the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim. You got the other Bible with you, Bill? You got it down there? All right. For a good cause they have made you desolate and crushed you from every side, that you should become a possession of the rest of the nation. Did you have taken up in the talk and the whispering of the people? Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. <coughs> Are you over there, Bill, on that? Yeah, every time it says Lord God, it says Jehovah Elohim, doesn't it? 36, verse what? 36 and verse uh, 4. That'll work. And said he unto me, Prophesy over these bones, and thou shalt say unto them, Thirty-six bones. and verse four. No, oh, that's thirty-seven. I'm sorry, Jim. Okay. I got excited. <laughs> Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear ye the word of my master Jehovah. Thus says my master Jehovah to the mountains and to the hills, to the channels and to the valleys, and to the desolate waste places, and to the cities that are forsaken, which have become our prey and a derision to the rest of the nations which are on every side. Okay, now what happened? The Bedouins are very happy living like Bedouins. They just use pasture land. They just pasture the land and they have sheep and goats out there and a few cows and camels and grazing in the land and they just move from place to place like they did with Mary and C. Cooper, the, the grass. That's the way they want to live. They like that. But the land... When Israel went into the land, that land responded. I remember when I was over there in 1975 and 76 in the land of Israel and Palestine that I heard a Jewish uh, a guy who was over there talking. He said, you know, he says, uh, the Jews and the Arabs don't get along real good, but the Arabs have some a saying that we don't say very often among other people. They said it's good for the land when the Jews walk on the land. The land responds to them because God blesses the land. Mm. I went over there and I saw strawberries that big around. I was never <laughs> seen strawberries this big. Mm. The land produced. They went over there and they developed. Some of the best medicines in the world are not developed here by our pharmaceutical countries, regardless of what the propag they propagate on television. <laughs> They're over there in that land. They're developing some of the best medicines and the best surgeries and the best agriculture in the world. Right over there in that land. And the land is responding. And they replanted the hills, the Lebanons of the cedars of Lebanon, and they started planting the the, the cedars back on the mountains over there. But Bill. Yeah, I'd mean, just like to point out a read an article on that thing. Uh, and it's the same thing. Israel went over there and developed date trees that were eight foot tall that produced twelve hundred pounds a year. The trees that the Palestinians want to keep are 20 foot tall and produce 250 pounds a year. That's the difference. They made a garden out of that place and they the, did it to the Palestinians. The like, land. It was like, a, like that fly. It was a garden and they give it to the Palestinians and they, 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 they crumbled everything. They live in a, in a more simple way. Yeah. But the land responds to Israel and the land will respond again. But I'm going to tell you something. Israel thinks they got God in their corner pocket today, but God is still their enemy today. Israel will never have their land back until they say, Blessed and holy is he that came in the Lord. They are still God-haters. I remember when I went over there with Brother Madden, and I walked up to the Whaley Wall. He stayed back. He said, I'm not going up there with those bunch of hellish, ungodly heathens. <laughs> That's what he said about those Jews up there. He said, look at those pagans kissing the word of God like it's God. He said, That's God's word. Let them kiss the Messiah. 
He's a let them kiss God, not the Bible. Amen. Beating her head against the wall like that. Well, they still got a lesson to learn. I'm going to tell you something. They got a lesson to learn yet, people. Therefore, mountains of Israel here. That's Brother Matthew. I tell you, Brother Matthew, I tell you what I learned a lot from him. You knew him. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was the one, only one of him. I guarantee you. He affected a lot of people. Yeah. Everywhere he went, he affected them. I remember when I walked into those mosques. I was ungodly. You know, I walked in there and walked on those three and four thousand year old carpets. Brother Man said, I'm not going into those hell holes of paganism. He stayed on the outside. I went in there. <laughs> Took my shoes off and walked on them. I wanted to see this stuff. I did too. <laughs> you went in there too? He told me later on, he said, well, he said, I finally broke down and went in there. Brother Phillips, like everybody else, he said, I became a pagan too. <laughs> the first time we went, he, he didn't give any of that. Prophesy concerning the land of Israel, say to the mountains, talk to the hills. And to the ravines and to the valleys, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my wrath because of you and have endured insults of all the nations. Because of you, Israel, I have been insulted. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have sworn that surely the nations which are around you will themselves endure their insults. But you, O mount of Israel, you put forth your branches, and bear your fruit for my people of Israel, for they will soon come. He's going to prepare the land. The land is getting prepared today, people. But God's people over there, Israel, have still got a long way to go. And their pride is one of their biggest obstacles. Always have it. And with us, what is one of our biggest obstacles? Pride. 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 <laughs> for behold I am for you and I will turn to you and you sh sh shall be cultivated and sown and he's talking to the land and I will multiply men on you and all the house of Israel all of it and the cities will be inhabited and the waste places will, will be rebuilt and I will multiply on you man and beast and they will increase the fruitful, and I will call you to be inhabited as you were formerly, and will treat you better than at the first. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. You will know that I am the Lord. Not because of them. You look at, now as we looked at Isaac, and as we looked at, at, at uh, Jacob, and as we looked at Abraham today, they had a lot of flaws, didn't they? But what was the grace that asset? God loved him. Now look at yourself. We have flaws, don't we? We're flawed. We have, we have a frayed hen, uh, garments. We are afraid people. We are not perfect. But God loves us. Now, as we, everybody was looking for the end of the, well, the rapture yesterday at 6 p.m., at the 21st of May. Well, you know, as I was going to the doctor, I think it was Friday, I was praying. I said, you know, Lord, actually, it's actually May the 21st today in Israel right now. And I said, if you wanted to rapture me up there, that would be real good. And I was just thinking about being raptured. What do you have you ever thought about being raptured? Well, we, we were going to get raptured because God loved us. One of these days, God's people are going to be just taken up out of this old miserable world. And then he's going to really deal with Israel for seven years. He's really going to put the, put the thumb screws on Israel for seven years. They get in the land. Now they read this verse right here in, these, in this chapter in the book of Ezekiel and say, we've got to make God's on our side. Israel has been through a lot in that land. I've been through there. Every battlefield, I've been on those battlefields. They still leave the jeeps and the tanks out there in the battlefield. Did you know that as signs of, of their relentless fighting for their land? Still there? 
You go over there. How many of you have seen? You've seen that, Sister Andy. Mm -hmm. You see them over there in land. Out in the middle of a farm field is a tank out there. And said, this is where we fought. And they talk about the, that great war in, in 67 and different 72 and different times. And they... <clears throat> God miraculously watched over them. But I want you to know one thing. They still don't believe in the Messiah. It's not that God is watching over them because of them, because they're still ungodly. God is watching over them for His name's sake, for something good that's going to get come. But if the rapture would have taken place yesterday, if it would have taken place, that would have been the beginning of the end, wouldn't it? What would happen? One of the tribulations starts? Yeah, that's when the tribulations start. <laughs> what would have happened? <coughs> what would happen? Zip, happen. people are gone. Yeah. All the gods, the church is out of the way now. Now God is going to start. In the beginning, Israel is going to think they got it made. Because what's, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the beginning? They're going to have a Messiah. They're going to have a false Messiah. A fake Messiah. A fake Messiah. And he's going to stand up and he's going to make a, a covenant for seven years. They're going to have a seven year covenant with... All the Arab nations. This is what's going to happen. I can say this flatly because this is from the Word of God. This Messiah is going to stand up and he's going to build a temple in Jerusalem. He's going to build a temple in Jerusalem. Here it is over there. American people, here's an idea of what it's going to be like right over here. Christian churches have spent millions of dollars in donations for this temple. But you know what that temple is going to be for? That's the Antichrist temple. Just remember that. Everything that's going over there in the Middle East today is not of God. The devil is going to be turned loose over there for seven years. For the first three and a half years, the land is going to flourish and everything. But over here in chapter 35, guess what happened over there? It said it's going to be a battlefield. God is going to See, we're in 36. All right, the restoration. We saw also the dispersion. Yet God is going to be kicked, caught, is going to have Israel kicked out of the land. Then he's going to regather them. And we have the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. That's going to take place. The rapture is going to take place. Then, God's people are out of the way. Now God... It's the beginning of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. What does that mean? Who's Jacob? That means when Israel really gets their come up for a That's while. when they get their hind end warmed up real yeah. good. The struggle on it. They're going to have a Messiah. They're going to have a temple. They're going to start. They're going to start sacrifices again. But what did the Book of Hebrews say about the sacrifices that the Jews sacrifice today? They're going to cut, those sacrifices cut you off from God. What sacrifice are you going to give after God gave the ultimate sacrifice of giving His Lamb, His Son? What, sa what sacrifice are they going to bring to God? I have seen, remember when we showed the, temp, what the, the, the films of the, of the guy walking into Jerusalem and they were going to start the animal sacrifices again? Every time they will do an animal sacrifice there, it will be blasphemy to God. Because God has sent His Messiah. And He's going to get sick. His belly is going to be full of it. Right in the middle of this tribulation period, God says, when you see the your Messiah stand in the temple area, right in the holy place, and say that I am God, what did he tell them to do? Flee to the mountains. Flee by the road top of the rooftops. He said, if you are on top of your house, right. sitting up there in the cool of the evening, and you find out, you see on the news, that the Messiah, the false Messiah, is in there declaring himself to be God in the temple area, he said, don't go down into the house. 
jump to the next house and jump to the next house and jump to the next house and get to Petra. Go down there. And then he says, that as they're fleeing down there, here Israel is down into Petra. Now a whole bunch of them is going to be killed. Two out of every three Jews is going to be killed by their Messiah. A lot of bloodshed. There we got Rex, and we got John, and we got, what's your name? <laughs> right there. Two out of us three is going to be killed. Every... You and you. Two out of three. <laughs> Rex supposed to be the survivor, see? Yeah. <laughs> He's got the wisdom. He's like, you guys go first. <laughs> They're going to be killed. <clears throat> Two out of three are going to be killed. And then it says the Antichrist and the nations of the world are all going to just all of a sudden show up. And the, that great valley is going to be 200 miles long. And it's going to be full of soldiers. Boy, talk about a, a battlefield. A battlefield 200 miles long, full of soldiers killing each other. So that will be two ungodly armies fighting against each That's other, right. right? And God says that he's going to use the land to swallow up those armies. Jim, I might ask, as a Christian seismologist over there, Christian seismologist. That battlefield does not exist today. Uh, no, there where the Bible talks Armageddon. There's uh, I think it's 300 miles long. There's a ball that goes yeah. exactly the line that the Bible says where the Armageddon. The battle, will, yeah, the battle will be be created. They will go there. Israel will be there, and then God will stand in there. And when they see all these armies coming against them, they're going to say, "What? Whoa, it's us. We're going to die." <laughs> Oh, another Masada. You know what they said the last time of Masada? Never another Masada. Oh, another Masada. Because this is what it's going to be. Here's a Masada again. They're back there. They're standing down there. And then they cry for the Messiah. And he appears to them. And then they say what? Where did you get the wounds in your hands? In your feet and in your side. And what does he say to them? In the house of my friends. Of my family. In the house of my family. Well, that's it for today, people. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Bill. Yeah. Jim, one thing I might add, folks, next time a church of Christ people just tears them up or anybody tells you that the children of Israel are scattered forever, never to become his children again, then I'm going to read the, 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 the 36th chapter of Ezekiel. Because this is where God says that He's bringing all of His children home, He's cleansing them, <coughs> not to make gives them the land of milk and honey, not for their sake, but for His name's sake, to show that He is the God, that He is God. And every time I get a Church of Christ guy that tries to tell me that, that uh, oh, they're dispersed, they're never here, read 36 chapter and get back to me, it highly gets them upset. Because <laughs> they was... can't got no answer for that. There was the primitive Baptist idea of Israel, and a lot of them, it came from Calvinism. And Calvin, John Calvin swore up and down that the Jews ought to be totally destroyed from the face of the earth, and so did Martin Luther. And that's where that comes from. And of course, uh, Alexander Campbell, he was of that uh, theological bent. And uh, they didn't believe in, in Israel would be restored to the land, or Israel would ever be. When, as, ma as a matter of fact, Martin Luther, all that Hitler did was put in Martin Luther's uh, indictments against the Jews. When he came in the land, they had been heard that preached for 200 years or more. When Hitler came on the scene and he just incarcerated, he did exactly what Martin Luther and Calvin and Augustine had called for, the destruction of the Jews. And uh, if they had done that, here these so-called world Christian leaders or, or Christian leaders of at their period of time, the, the revolution of the Protestant Reformation leaders were calling for the destruction of Israel, for the nation, for the Jews. And that's what they did. They put them in death camps just like Martin Luther had uh, said to do. And uh, they were going to neuter the men and not allow the women to have any children. They were going to do away with them. But uh, God still has a promise for them. But they're... All the whole tribulation period is, is to get Israel ready to accept the Messiah. They're going to think it's a lot better. 
And they're going to think that God buy them no matter what they do. He would buy old Abraham and Isaac, would he? But he's getting ready. He's he's getting a big, he's going to soften them up. He's going to tenderize them. Tenderize their hearts just a little bit. All right. I have a question. Yes. If two out of three men are killed, what about the women? How are you taking them off? He's taking men, women, women. All right. <laughs> <laughs> five, out of six Jews, five out of every six Gentiles are going to die. That's five, six. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed, people. Five out of every six people Gentiles, and two out of every three Jews are going to die. That's a lot of dead people. Yeah. You, you know, a, a guy the other day is the only guy I've agreed with about guys said they'd be able to have two wives. One to cook and clean and one to tend bar. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brent. <coughs> okay. Well, we have men's power lunch coming up. We have guest speaker. Kat.